to another episode, another iteration, final few chapters. Let's read, Suck Up the Purple Buttermilk by Donald Otis Steiger. This is a book about heroin addiction and recovery. The most important part is the recovery part. Very powerful, emotional, uh, meaningful book. Can't recommend this book enough. If you want to read this book for yourself, if you know somebody or have struggled through addiction yourself, highly recommend it. The link will be in the description in my YouTube. I'm live streaming this on Instagram and YouTube at The One Who Cares. And you can buy this book and help support his message and share this book with your friends and loved ones as well. We're jumping in right where we left off, chapter 9. We are reading the last few chapters of this very profound, powerful book. And um, I'm really excited because it's been a while since we uh, had a book reading this uh this emotional, this, this impactful. So let's jump into it. Chapter nine, Suck Up the Purple Buttermilk by Donald Otis Steiger. Coming out of the fog. No one can promise a dream come true. Stepping out in faith depends solely on you. I love the poems. I absolutely love the poems. He adds every chapter. <clears throat> After years of alcohol and drug abuse, denying my past and hurting myself, I had now been sober for three years. To continue on that narrow path required a willingness to examine my own behavior in terms of what flawed areas needed to be changed. This is called taking a personal inventory of your character defects. In other words, it's focusing on how and why you hurt other people not on what those individuals did to hurt you. In every situation, I had become accustomed to being filled with fear, anger, and self-pity, wanting to change the outside before I would the inside. I believed the only way to change was by acknowledging five things, who I am, where I am, where I have come from, where I want to go, and what am I doing to get in my own way getting there? Small strides are still big when they can change the direction of a path, of course. Despite my hellish past, I chose to both love and accept myself and get on my knees each morning and ask God to remove any fear I had about the day and to remove any desire For a drink or drug. Though I was sober, smoking one and a half packs of cigarettes was still part of my daily routine. To me, I still had another addiction to battle, another drug to overcome. This was the rebirth of Donnie Steiger that included attending AA meetings regularly and striving not to hurt myself or anyone else again. In trying to lead a normal life, I had ignored the pain of fear, hate, Jealousy and anger turn inward, depression. But now for the first time in my life, I came to understand my true motives of seeking to ease my pain while continuing to hurt myself. You can refer to this as sabotaging your life by living with fear and uncertainty and attempting to soothe the pain with drugs and alcohol. This kind of existence only makes your faults, weaknesses, failures, and inadequacies stand out more, which in turn prompts a continuous replay of all the unresolved issues. For me, it involved a, a name to a name a few. Excuse me. It involved to name a few. Fear of failing as a father, and the shame of not knowing how to read and write. Coming to terms with my own defects was not a pleasant experience, nor for anyone who wants to improve him or herself.
because our character flaws can only hurt us since denial only works until we can face the truth about ourselves. That's why our society is going at such a fast, reckless pace. Everyone is busy being in denial of his or own, her own pain, not stopping to take the time to deal with it in order to find healing. Although you see a new life that's free, the change of new frightened, frightened me. I had two choices facing me first. I could be willing to face the truth about myself, or I could simply refuse to do so. But I discovered that in facing all my shortcomings, there was security and spiritual growth in learning how to accept others and myself just as we were, <clears throat> just as we are, which is still very difficult to practice. Part of my ability to stay sober every day was in taking inventory of the exact nature of my wrongs, because in the past I felt it was me who had always been wronged, and I could never believe that I owed anybody, anyone, an apology. Believing this only leads a person to commit a continuous cycle of abuse against others and oneself. There were plenty of escapes along the way. Relationships were one of my avoidance, uh, one of my ways, or one way of avoidance and escape. The best way to find out how you are going to act in a relationship is to get in one. Period. Because though through through it you'll learn exactly in what areas you are at the weakest. I discovered that relationships are the miracle grow to character defects. Until you find out what they are and deal with them, you'll never succeed in one. Whenever I felt that a relationship I was in was threatened or I experienced jealousy, I would always automatically detach by shutting down, closing up, locking the doors and building walls to isolate myself in solitude. One way that helped me stay in touch with the realities of my shortcomings was by playing in a sober rock, excuse me, sober rock band. I found it to be encouraging hanging around people trying to stay sober like me because in a band, egos can get in the way and start the fire of decision among its members. Dissension, sorry, D-I-S-S-E-N-S-I-O-N among its members. We had to learn that even though each of us was different, in order to be successful performers, we had to act as one, undivided unit. Although I still managed to get my three minute drum solos in. But the last thing I wanted to do was give up those character defects, which had always worked so well for me. But I did, I had to. If I wanted to get better, I looked at my sexual conduct, fear, insecurity, jealousy, and anger, and realized that rather than acknowledge them, I acted out in rage to hurt others and myself as well. Yes, even in sobriety. One of the main problems in being detached from everything and everyone is that it starts to make you very sick. This happened to me when I was too embarrassed to share with anyone my illiteracy usually because someone sooner or later would tell me to get my GED or do this or that. I got very tired of hearing that since what, it, what is easy for one person may not be so for another, so easy for another. I have come to learn something very important about myself. I have been blessed with common sense and practical wisdom, whereas some considered to be intelligent might, might not possess those qualities. One reason why I had kept people at bay was because I had always felt that I was retarded, not a good person, not worthy of anything good in my life, imperfect world. And so to hide my true feelings from others, I put on a facade that everything was okay, which worked until I got sober. Then I couldn't stuff it in any longer. I had to have a new attitude if I were going to overcome my denial. I had to step out in faith, making it a daily challenge to stay sober, 
and at peace with myself. Sadly, many people never overcome their denial. I consider myself to have made significant strides in dealing with my own denial. Accepting responsibility first, correcting ir irresponsibility second. All of this took time and effort to remain committed to that goal. Working three jobs, I had very little money, paying child support, going through a divorce, to spend beyond the basics, basic necess, necess, words are so hard, necessary for living, the basics necessary for living. It is very hard to accept life on life's terms when you've spent most of your life masking all the pain so that others can't see it. I had to come to the realization that it was me who made my mistakes and had created my own mess. And therefore, it was me who must set out, set about the task of correcting them. Telling another person the exact nature of all my wrongs was the first step of being honest with God, another human being, and myself. Divorce. Bringing forth man's duty to provide and protect an expectation of unforgiving society I had to neglect. The relationships that were to come in sobriety after my divorce with a woman in particular would be codependent in nature to stay sober. I couldn't remain with someone who continued to use. If it were not a matter of life and death, I would never have left Anne. I still loved her then, and I still care about her well-being today. I am truly sorry for the failing of our marriage and pray for her forgiveness. I made a sincere commitment to stay clean and sober, whatever it took. This was one of the few things in my life that I decided to take a positive stand Yet, I found that going to AA meetings regularly had become, at this stage, frustrating because my ex was not allowing me to see our, my own children. Sometimes, I would attend a meeting and just scream at the top of my lungs when it came time to introduce myself. After holding everything in until I got there, this freaked out a lot of people, and you know it worked. Because that better place, what better place to do it? Many members came over to me afterwards and would say it's going to be all right, and I knew it would be, but it was going to be a very frustrating journey that lay ahead of me. Verbally venting out loud was not only expressing my frustration, but for time, it was also a way of telling myself, I'm not a victim anymore. I don't need to be full of self-pity. I no longer have to pull others into my mess. I am now being responsible. I am reading... A very amazing book called Suck Up the Purple Buttermilk, live on Instagram and YouTube at the moment. Chapter 10, Mother. Searching for answers. Why have you gone? Where did you go? I'll never be the same. How will I grow? Help me, Mom. I can't find my way. I need you with me to guide me each day. After being in a relationship for two years, my insecurities again surfaced and Christine and I split up. This was devastating to me because I was very much in love with her and we had become quite attached to one another. As a result, I became deeply depressed and down in life in general. This after being sober for five years, I had lost my job, car, and apartment. Therefore broke, making it necessary to live with my father a big letdown after struggling for so long to afford a place of my own. There were days when I found myself sitting on the end of my bed and staring across the room, crying, not fully understanding why. Since I didn't know then, and this was happening to me, I took another inventory and noticed that the people on my list, I didn't include the name of my mother. I couldn't grasp why I was able to forgive and ask to be forgiven by them, but not to do the same for my own mother. The one thing I, didn't, I did feel was that my mom really didn't matter. I asked myself, 
What did I ever do to her anyway? This is the woman who beat and abandoned me, so at the wise suggestion of a friend, to do a thorough accounting of my actions, I wrote her name down on my list and asked, how have I wronged her? And I came up with these three wrongs. I hated her. I resented her. And I was angry with her. Now I understood why her name had been missing from the list. Since the start of my sobriety, while writing three, while writing these reasons, I began crying because I knew in my heart that for the first time in the denial of my mother, the truth had revealed itself. She was an alcoholic. She might have had it worse than me, taking all the pain and unhappiness out of my father, my brother, my sister, myself, and herself. Releasing all these pent-up emotions I carried my entire life, I decided I needed to call her after no contact for 28 years. In order to make my amends, I did this not knowing where she lived, not knowing if I would ever see her again. Within 24 hours of praying for the chance to make things right with my mother, my brother Eddie, not aware of my prayer, came to the door and asked if I wanted our mother's phone number. Wow. When I said yes, I turned to him and asked God, oh no, excuse me, him and asked, guess what? Do you know that mother's, that mom's an alcoholic? He replied, yeah, Don, I know. But Eddie, I said, she's an alcoholic who might have had it far worse than we ever did. All he could say was, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll see you later. Giving me the number, he turned and walked away. I called Sue and went over to her place to use the phone. My mom answered the phone and said, hello. And I said the word mom. Then she said, Donnie, these same two words not uttered in 28 years were repeated several times before the conversation continued. After this, we both began crying uncontrollably and I had to turn to the phone. I had to turn the phone over to Sue, not able to continue speaking. This moment was an intense healing experience for me. I was determined to talk to her, whether she was in a nursing home or living alone, whether sober or not, just to tell her, Mom, I am sorry. So my sister and I made arrangements to visit Mom in Philadelphia. When we arrived at her place and got off the elevator, the first thing she did was take me inside her apartment, sit me down on the couch, grab both my hands, look straight into my eyes, and with tears running down her cheeks, she told me how sorry she was and how much she had missed me and now realized how much she had hurt me, had hurt not only me, but all of us. That moment is something I shall never forget. This was my mom making amends to me and it took me by surprise. After all, I had come with the intention of expressing my need for her forgiveness. At that time, mom had been sober for 10 years I learned that she had been in several detox programs and halfway houses, but most importantly, she too could not read or write. Now I knew why she would always yell at me all the time, being frustrated with her only literacy and too embarrassed to admit it to her kids. I decided that I was going to move my mother back to Worcester in order to establish a relationship with her for the first time in my life at the age of 46. I tried to spend all my spare time with her at home, at her, at her home, especially on the holidays. We would attend meetings together occasionally. During this healing process, I began to find out more about the woman I was now proud to call my mother. I learned about her past history, that she was brought up poor in the backwoods of Tennessee without any formal education. At a very early age, she had been pulled out of school to take care of her dying father. We were able to develop a very loving and compassionate bond, and I could for the first time ever have the love I had for her without holding the past against her. 
There was no way that I would allow the past to ruin the present, not after being given the unexpected gift of having a mom and my life again for a brand new start. I heard this saying while watching the movie Magnolia, which portrayed the healing prophecies, prophecies of its characters. Page 100. Sometimes we may be, though, with our past, but our past may not be, though, with us. Excuse me. I'll reread that. Sometimes we may be through with our past. Our past may not be through with us. Our world is full of people who can't handle the present because they are still holding on to the resentments of the past. My mom and I started attending a Pentecostal church together because I had come to know the Pastor Joey as a personal friend who would preach, play, rhythm guitar, and sing in the praise of the worship hour. I also began playing my drums. It was something I enjoyed doing as a way of giving back to God for what he had done for me, removing the desire to drink and drug. Set me free, set me free, set me free. I am free, I am free, I am free. Thank you, thank you, thank you. There were movements, or excuse me, there were moments when my mom and I would just stand at the altar holding hands while praying and the tears flowing down our faces, evidence that the barriers between us were breaking, breaking down and bringing further healing to people who were once alienated in body, mind, and spirit. Soon after we were baptized together, my mom noticed pain in her lungs, excuse me, pain in her legs. An examination revealed that she had breast cancer. They removed one breast and part of her lung. She underwent chemotherapy for one year. Needless to say, this was a very difficult time for both of us, but I loved her and wanted to be with her, especially now. Having this opportunity was something I considered a gift in, it, in itself. Now she could have someone with her, not needing to endure it alone. She did, in time, get better, only to fall ill again about a year later. She received the bad news that the cancer had spread to her liver, and the diagnosis was that she only had three months to live. <clears throat> Damn. This was hard news to accept because my mother and I had just begun to know and love one another the way it should be in a normal family. I could have reacted to the situation in a negative way and shut off everything and everyone around me, blaming God for breaking up what had just been brought, been put back together again. But I said, okay, mom, what is it you want me to do? Her answer, I want to stay in my own apartment to die, not to go to a nursing home. When I asked her again, her response matched the first answer. That's all. She then asked if I would be with her through it all, saying in the same breath, you've got other things to do. I'm not at all. I'm not all that important, but I assured her, yes, mom, you're important. You are important to me. You are the most important person in my life. I contacted hospice so that they could help me bathe her and show me how to administer drugs to her whenever they weren't there, such as morphine patches, demoral and tranquilizers. The hospice people considered me to be a caretaker for my mother and I am indebted to them for their assistance. We watched her favorite television programs and talked about different things that would help. In some way we kept her mind off the pain. Oftentimes I would kneel by her bed, hold her hand and pray with her. I would also continuously read the Bible and kept remembering day and night the verse, this too shall pass. The kind of pain I was experiencing did not afflict my body, but only the heart. A loving pain that comes from caring for someone close whom you love uncondi unconditionally, 
no matter what. Forever is one day at a time. One day sometimes seems like forever. Never in my life did I, nor could I imagine that in getting sober and coming to a personal relationship with my higher power, whom I choose to call God, that I would be given the drug of my choice to someone I had come to love and care about so deeply. I had asked God daily to remove the obsession for a drug or drink, and here I was having all these drugs right in front of my eyes. And not once get the urge to pick up and use and start using them again. That to me was remarkable, a miracle in itself. Beside which having the capacity to care for my mother after having undergone a case of severe depression. It was the healing process between us that helped me to be there for her, whether she was well or sick. What better gift? For you, the reader, there are several points I wish to make. Whatever has been done to you by your mother or father, remember they have brought you into this world and did their best to raise you. Forgiveness is not so much for them as it is for you. One can't sit around waiting for someone to ask for his or her forgiveness because that day may never come. A person must take the first step himself before it is too late. We must forgive ourselves first for carrying anger and resentments held against a parent. To verbally forgive them is allowing yourself to heal. The words, I forgive you. It's saying, I do in fact without hesitation or a reservation forgive. The act of saying and hearing, I forgive you, can be summarized into three parts. First, Forgiveness involves making a decision. It is to realize that carrying around resentments has made you sick. Second, forgiveness involves recognizing what it is that you need to forgive and then verbally telling the person the reason why you are forgiving and genuinely and to genuinely mean it. For unless it's done in sincerity, it will all be for nothing. Third, Forgiveness involves a continuing process. It is preserving along the steady forgiveness road, aware that it is an act, a decision to practice daily in all your relations with family, friends, and coworkers. Finally, when my mother did pass away in only two months rather than three, it was the most unusual experience for me because I had never before seen anyone die in my presence. I called the hospice nurse and asked her to come over as she asked me to do in order to help me flush all the drugs down the toilet. There was no one there for me to answer to, but all alone I had come to terms with the fact not to use drugs. For me to use following my mother's death in her place is something I don't believe I could have ever recovered from. The nurse already knew that I was a recovering addict because I wanted to tell on my disease, which is great inventory, especially if you're going to be trusted to administer them. Throughout this ordeal, I was never in tears, but was able to make the necessary arrangements required at some passing, at someone's passing. It felt like my mom was still there with me, and now instead of all these years of abuse preceding this event, I kept seeing my mother giving me reassurance, love, and security, things I never received before our reconciliation. Doing so had opened up a spiritual avenue for growth in myself, as well as being there for my mom on good terms. With mended hearts to say goodbye, up until that point, my mother was only in my heart, in the form of anger. My thoughts of her were only of hatred. I could never identify with anyone as my mother figure, which I'm sure had a lot to do with my poor relationships with other women. The most important thing I got from this whole experience of renewal with my mother is the happy memories of ultimately being together to share our love and lives. The void in my heart had now been filled. 
And even with her passing, I am grateful to have the gift of getting to know her, love her, and accept her as my mother. My spirit is and will always be enriched with the wonderful feelings of someone who, by God's grace, turned out to be the wonderful mother for whom I had always been looking. Today, my relationships with women have improved. And most importantly, I now have different tapes of my mother to play and replay until I see her again. Never too late. It's never too late to be a father. It's never too late to be a mother. It's never too late to be a son. It's never too late to be a daughter. It's never too late to be a brother. It's never too late to be a sister. It's never too late to be a friend. Until the end, then it's too late. Unless you want to make amends to a slab of marble. And there's a picture of him reunited with his mother and his brother and sister to the right and left of him. If you want to check out the picture, highly recommend buying the book. Link will be in the description in my YouTube. Chapter 11. <clears throat> Boston Marathon. Back of the pack. 2000. Running. When I'm running, the wind whistles through my ears. Sweat instead of fears. One more mile. There goes another trial. A pretty girl at which I smile. Pick up the pace, for in running on time, got to keep in shape, no time to wait. A car pulls out in front of me. I stop and look. You almost hit me. Get going again. There is sweat on my chin. I looked around in many sights that are free. The world that God made just for me. Thank you for my health, for you see, I am so lucky to have me, the greatest gift of all life. Great poem. With the draining and time-consuming days of caring for my mother behind me, it was now time to increase my training for the approaching Boston Marathon. This would be my first time running it at the age of 50. My last one was 22 years ago and the Silver Lake Dodge Marathon when I was 28 years old. Up to this point, I had put in 25 to 30 miles of running each week and thought, why not run Boston after training for almost six months? So I picked up the pace and began adding more miles, little by little, conditioning. My body to go, conditioning my body to go the distance, 26.2 miles. I also included swimming and weightlifting as part of my daily workout, which doesn't hurt. So after competing, one 18 and 19 mile respectively, oh, excuse me, after completing one 18 and 19 mile respectively and two 20 miles, I was ready. I soon purchased my bus ticket that would take me to Hoppingen. Hop, Kinting. Words are so hard. Hopkinton, Massachusetts, where the race begins. I was positioned in the back, way back with the other bandits in the field. As I looked around, all I could see were thousands upon thousands of other runners, more than seventeen thousand, the most ever in the race's history. After the gun went off, I was several miles into the run. Something happened to my awareness that would tell the real story of the Boston Marathon. Something more than just the top elite runners competing to win and have the wreath, the wreath, W-R-E-A-T-H, the wreath of victory placed on their head. For in looking over to my left, I observed an overweight woman with a huge written letter on her back that read, Angela Somers, fictitious, fictitious name, died. 
August 19, 1999, of breast cancer. The letter expressed how much she loved her mother. The woman was running to raise money for cancer research. To my right, I saw a man whose leg had been at amputated, walking on crutches. And man, he was really kicking it too. In front of me was a young man in his 20s, sitting in a wheelchair with cerebral palsy. His body was so twisted that his head was looking over his left shoulder while scooting himself along, going backwards. Each of these people, having heart and determination, were going their own pace, inch by painstaking inch, just to finish no matter what the cost, physically and mentally. As I passed them, many more stories came into focus. I noticed the thousands of spectators lining the route that were clapping and whistling and listening to the band's play. Young and old alike were hanging out oranges, water, Vaseline, wet naps, and sport drinks. That's why I was able to identify with everyone and have my faith in humanity restored. Just a little more. I reflected upon all that I had gone through in order to get to this point in my life and being healthy and fit enough to run this historic new millennium marathon that finished with the time of 4.30, assuming that's four hours and 30 minutes. Above the noise of the crowd, I could hear my mother calling my name. Donnie, Donnie. I had a deep sense of her presence with me as means of support. Through my journey had not been identical to that of most people. I was able to grasp the truth that sometimes in life we're waiting sometimes or yeah, we're waiting, sometimes we're listening, and sometimes there are downhills and uphills to face. Never forgetting that when cresting the top, there's always a cool breeze and the wind whistling as you look at the as you look to the flats below. Understand that there will always be the hills, trials, and the flats, easy times, and the valleys, down times, which are the challenge of enduring the testing of your personal goals and ambitions. Allow yourself to accept the hand, or excuse me, accept the hard fact that with any great task, if you want to get to the top of the hill, sometimes heartbreak hill, and make it to the finish line, you were going to have to suck up the purple buttermilk. Mm. Chapter 12, Going Home. Home is where you know where you're at. Let me read that. Home is where you know where you are at. Home is where you hang out, hang your own hat. Home is where you lay your own head. Home is where you make your own bed. I have come to believe that when the decision was made to go home, I was actually seeking peace, peace of mind and peace of spirit. I was full of fear that the feelings would overwhelm me, but it wasn't like that at all. It was gratitude, forgiveness, and sadness for the little boy who did not have a chance in 1950 to be standing right there and knowing how hard I had worked to return here, letting out all of the welled up, welled up tears after so many, many years of painful memories and joyous accomplishments was something I never dreamed could ever happen. While looking at the house in which I had cherished the most, and that is the only place I'll always consider to be my real home, I kept saying to myself, I'm okay, I'm okay. I made it, I made it. Remembering and letting go, remembering and letting go. I'm home, I'm home. I love you, Donnie. I love myself. And I will do whatever it takes to survive. 
I did not want to leave Hawthorne, the home of my childhood, that day, but in reality, I did not want to leave myself anymore or escape from, escape for I felt that I was home now and that is where I'll stay. There's a picture of him. Donnie's a cool stud, looking good, Don Aver. <laughs> Straight shooter in a hat. Ashbury, me posing with a homeless man in San Francisco during my summer 2000 trip to California. And he has a sign. And if you want to know what the sign says, you got to buy the book and look at it yourself. We made it to the appendix. No shit. Chapter 11, chapter 12 was one page. Wow. Appendix. November 15th, 1998. Dear old, good, old Donnie. I hope you are enjoying all the blessings of life. When you read this letter, I am doing just great. Thank you for the photograph you sent me. I treasure it ever much. Looking at it brought a lot of mem memories to me. I guess things and feelings. I shared those three months I spent at Spectrum House with all you guys made a great impression on me. I'll never forget. It's like a special bond that holds us together. Having gone through a dramatic stage of our lives, a significant love like no other grows to the point that we become true family. I remember the very first night I spent at the house. You came and took the time to talk to me about how things were supposed to be done. While at the same time you were helping me to do my bed right then, I knew you were a loving father and I could see right away your good nature. I'll never forget the way you helped me like that night that they gave me a spare spare parts. When I couldn't stop crying, even after we all went to bed, you were the only one who came over to my bedside to hug and comfort me, just like a big brother. I have blessed you ever since. I have blessed you ever since, Donnie. And by God's grace, I always do. Don't you ever forget that you are a good man, a great friend and should feel proud about your good nature, gift endowed by God himself. Those would not see this, those who would not see this are just plain ignorant and we bless them too. So don't take shit from no one. Be patient. There will be someone who will notice this high price quality in you and your value you for what you are and value you for what you are. But better yet, be good to your own self. Well, pal, as I told you over the phone, I'm taking care of my family's business, managing our properties. I have a daughter, 10 and a four year old boy. I go to Narcotics Anonymous and for the first and for the last 11 years, I feel great. I might come over to see all of you guys next summer or next September. I'll surely let you know. Well, buddy, take care of yourself. And we'll all talk real soon. Love, Raul. Can't even pronounce his last name. <laughs> the last quiz. The last quiz. Sorry if I'm butchering that. And there's a picture of one of the top Elvis impersonators in Las Vegas, Stefan. Connolly. I think he uh, met him. And there's a couple more pictures. Amy's graduation picture. His father with um, the Lone Ranger in Las Vegas. That's pretty cool. Jesse, 21 years old, driving on the highway in Fort Lauderdale. A couple other pictures of uh, these are all black and white pictures. Life isn't over just because you're sober, living it up in Fort Lauderdale. Another reason to stay sober, my first grandchild, John Otis Steiger, born December 29th, 2000. Holy shit, he's a year younger than me. 
<laughs> God damn. The parents, Jesse and Stephanie. And the final picture is a vacationing picture. Don Nader. Looking good, buddy. Looking good, Donster. <laughs> Vacationing in Fort Lauderdale, January 2001. I'll show that picture. That's the one picture you guys get. That's the Don Nader right there. Look at that. Look at the stud. Look at that stud. <laughs> There he is. <laughs> and then there is the uh, pun and poem index, which I'm actually might as well just read these because I I, I absolutely love the poems that he had here. Here's some uh, books recommended by the author. Number one, the Bible. Might do a book reading of the Bible one day. I haven't read the whole thing myself. Carlson Richard, Don't Sweat the Small Stuff. Mm. Hi Hyperion Books. Sounds like a good one. Chandler Steve, 100 Ways to Motivate Yourself. That's something I would love to read. Ingstrom Ted, The Pursuit of Excellence. I think I've heard of that before. Zondervan Publishing House. Father Fred and the 12 Steps. Ambassador Books. Johnson Michael, Olympic gold medalist. Slaying the Dragon. Regan Books. Lindquist Mary. Marie. Holding Back. Why We Hide the Truth About Ourselves. That sounds like a really good book. Richard Jennifer, Diary of Abuse, Diary of Healing, Recovery Communications, Baltimore, 1996. And there's two more books he recommends. Silverstein, Shel Silverstein, The Giving Tree. I'm so glad he has that in here. My favorite poet of all time is Shel Silverstein. My favorite poem of all time is... The Perfect High, I think. I just want to mention that just because it complements this book very nicely. The Perfect High by Shel Silverstein. Williams Marjorie, The Velveteen Rabbit, or How Toys Became Real. I haven't read those books. So I'll have to check them out. Those were the books that Donnie recommended, and I threw my recommendation of my favorite poem in there as well. Secret of Life. <clears throat> this is a quick poem by an unknown author. Take time to think. It is the source of power. Take time to play. It is the secret of perpetual youth. Take time to be friendly. It is the road of happiness. Take time to work. It is the price of success. Take time to pray. It is the greatest power on earth. Take time to love and be loved. It is the way of God. God bless America, picture of the flag, in memory of those who lost their lives and their loved ones on September 11, 2001. And then we have ordering information. To order books, please call 774-232-0537 or email steigerbooks at yahoo.com. That is S-T-E-I-G-E-R-B-O-O-K-S at yahoo.com or visit amazon.com to order by mail write to donald o steiger 26 i'm not sure if i should be reading this out but i'm gonna read it out anyway um you know what i'll let you just buy the book link in the description 
cost per book's 12 bucks, folks. That's uh, two cups of coffee for a phenomenal book. Available for workshops, lectures, and groups. For pricing and scheduling, please contact steigerbooks at yahoo.com. And there's an additional number here. That is 508-885-5861. That was that. What a phenomenal read. I've been uh, reading for an hour these last few pages here. And all together, five-hour read for me. So, what an amazing book. This is probably my second favorite book of all time. I would have to say... I haven't have too, I don't have too many books under my belt. Probably a solid twenty thirty that I've genuinely read through, um, start to finish, every single word. This is my second favorite book of all time. It's probably the most important book I've read, um, as terms of value. A uh, very phenomenal perspective from a great man who does great things and inspires a lot of people and i hope this reaches a lot of people so do us a favor do donnie and myself a favor of sharing this video to those who can't afford reading the book this will be out there on youtube and my instagram forever hopefully for as long as the internet exists <laughs> and um he will also be posting it on his youtube channel which is linked in my description on youtube at the one who cares so, I really hope you guys enjoyed this uh, reading, and please write down in the comments below what future books you would like to me to read. And until then, I will wish you guys many blessings and nothing but peace and joy and health and happiness. And if you remember anything, anything at all, anything that I said, I want you to remember one thing. You're gorgeous. Peace.